Okay, everybody, welcome to Investing with IBD, sponsored this week by Vantage Point. It's Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021, and I'm Justin Nielsen, your host, along with Arusha Pires, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. Uh, welcome back, Arusha. Thanks for joining me again, as you do every week. It's always great to be here, Justin. Yeah, and on the show, we have Dan Fitzpatrick from Stock Market Mentor coming back to the show. Uh, Dan has you know, been on a couple times, I believe, and he's uh, joining us. Uh, well, he was born and raised in the raisin capital of the world, um, has some great guitars uh, behind him that we can see. And uh, welcome, welcome back to the show, Dan. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. You should have me more often. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice little plug there. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we can fit you in. Let's see how you do this time and then we'll, we'll okay. make our decision. <laughs> so be on your best behavior. Uh, so with Dan, we're going to talk a little bit about where the markets are. Uh, we've had a kind of interesting last couple of days uh, in the market indexes, but also we're going to chat with Dan a little bit about the whole uh, cycle of the market to kind of take that step back and look at the bigger picture there. Um, and of course, as always on the third segment, we're going to talk about some of the stocks that are on Dan's radar. So Dan, let's get right to it. Uh, this was a kind of a rough start to the week. Uh, it kind of felt like the indexes were getting a little extended. We were noting that, uh, look, the NASDAQ composite was about 8% above its 50-day moving average line. That tends to be an area where we start to get a little uh, concerned about at least a short-term pullback. Um, so we didn't have much of a pullback a, a couple of weeks ago. Is this one going to be a little bit more serious, do you think? Or is uh, that support of the 21-day moving average line kind of telling you uh, game, game on still? No, well, I think uh, probably I'll, I'll split the baby there. Um, I don't think... I think we could be in, in more of a pullback. I kind of don't think that the 21 day will hold, but I don't think this rally's over. And I don't think the NASDAQ, I'm just looking at the, uh, at the NASDAQ 100. You know, I, I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's going to pull back to test the 50. Uh, it is pretty high. Uh, but the reason I say that is because, uh, you know, we've had some pretty strong volume. Um, generally, the market's been holding up. And I, I, if you look at the weekly chart uh, and just kind of zoom it back there, Arusha, into maybe the start of, it, you know, two years, uh, yeah, about two years back, you can see that this is just some, this is just typical market cycle where it's got, you know, what I call, for lack of a better term, a whoop de doos, you know, they're just kind of up and down and up and down. But for the most part, um, the lows continue to be higher. And I, I think that we got that real cleansing move uh, in early 2020. And you guys know what that's from. And, and I think that really was a big washout for a lot of people. I, I don't think this is going to end. And I've heard this is the thing that's interesting. I'm talking about the wall of worry now. Yeah. I've heard people look at two days of this and they hear about the, you know, BBB build back better. I call it Biden's bloated budget. But um, so they hear about that and they think for whatever reason, that's going to be a bad thing for stocks. And oh, now we're coming to the end of it. There's no other alternative. And so, I'm looking at this stuff and I just think um, I just think the market's going to continue going. And I hear people and I read these things. Oh, Powell again, quantitative easing over. This is where we start paying the piper um, that I've heard that argument literally for years. I mean, I, I think, you know, you're Justin, I think probably your great grandkids are probably going to be mad at you. Um, because that's when the market tanks. I just think it's going to get going. <laughs> I mean, sooner or later, somebody's going to pay for it, but right. I think we're probably all going to be off to our, off to the next world, which, you know, hopefully you don't have sun protection factor 98 there. Um, so anyway. Well, well Dan, uh, so go, going back with, so because you're bringing in some of the news items and the wall of yeah. worry, there's always going to be negative news out there. There's always going to be some way to justify why you should get out of the market. Talk about how empowering just looking at charts and kind of that behavior is, you know, with kind of that a larger overall market analysis. Well, yeah, when 
here's the, the the thing and i you know i've taught you know thousands of traders and um i continue to learn you know i i don't know it all i don't know very much at all but i study like a demon um and what i've seen is people get sucked in to the daily charts uh, a lot of times they extrapolate uh, information off the intraday charts and think, oh, that's that's the end of Tesla. Um, and so what I've seen happen, and, and from what Dave Ryan said uh, one time, he said he never saw Bill O'Neill uh, look at a, at a daily chart. He always stuck with the weeklies. And my my approach now is that I just look at the weekly charts for trends. And most of the time, what happens is you'll get these oscillations and every single time people think, okay, well, that's it. And they start selling stocks. Maybe they liquidate everything, but they certainly lighten up. And then when the end does not occur, now they got to buy back and they're typically buying back at higher levels. And so the market just keeps going higher and it gets to a point where it doesn't make sense. Like, oh my gosh, look at the PE, look at this, look at that. But, you know, Arusha, you're right. If you just look at the charts, you don't, you know, you could even not even look at news flow. You could right. trade as long as you had a good Wi Fi connection, you could trade in a cave uh, if you just had um, charts. Yep. And that sounds really simplistic, but trading is really not that hard. We make it hard. And if you just say, well, you know, I'm, why'd you buy this stock? Well, it's going up. You know, that's, I mean, everything yep, else, exactly. just, everything else is just nuance, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so I look at, I look at the charts a lot, you know, I have to, for, for my members, we kind of zoom in and out, but every time I get asked, uh, so is this the top, you know, I always get back to what I think is a pretty good axiom for trading, which is tops are more processes. They can't be called uh, yeah, yeah. bottoms. True bottoms are events like you can look at them on the chart and the real big bottoms. You know, if you if you're still looking at charts because you're like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> you, can, you can totally see uh, bottoms because they're 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 events. They're just like, boom, this big move down and then a snap back and you can see it on breadth indicators too um tops are these processes that can take you know they can take a shoot you know they can take months and months and months and even then oh turns out this was just a high base and now we're going higher again and so where it gets down what it gets down to to me is i look at the stocks that i want uh i own certain things i don't have I don't have a huge diversified trading portfolio. I I do, you know, most of our most of our uh, wealth is in a longer term portfolio, and we're pretty much, you know, frankly, even more diversified than I'd like. But you know, I don't run everything myself uh, anymore. I have other people who have things to say. Um, but with my trading stuff, you know, I'll, I'll probably have six or seven stocks in in my account at one time. And as long as those are working, then I don't really care what the overall market does. If they stop working, that's when I start caring because then it's time to maybe maybe switch, uh, switch trading strategies, uh, the way we analyze the market, or maybe it's time just to kind of back off. Um, because the idea is you're, you're going to lose money in the market, but the idea is to be losing less money than you make and when you're make you know when you go on these runs you know you're not going to have um you're not going to have you know hey two percent a month and i'm good or five percent a month sometimes you know you're going to lose a little bit of money in any given month but the idea is if you look at how your trading is going and and even the way the market behaves there's just a small handful of times throughout the year where you really get the big gains. And if you're out of the market at that time, then what happens is, okay, you don't get those big gains, but that's not the worst part of the story. The worst part of the story is you see that you've missed those big gains, right? And so then what are you doing? You're trying to play catch up.
yeah. and you're trying to play catch up in a market you know that has spikes on the road you know you're you're not going to get any traction when the market's not allowing you to so by missing out on the upside where you know all you really had to do is stay invested by missing out on the upside you get into this cycle of you know bad trading uh, feeling bad about yourself you just kind of this downward spiral that ultimately ends with you know, maybe trading isn't for me. <laughs> right. And then you yeah. give up and throw in the towel. Well, let's talk a little bit, though, about because um, I feel like this market has has suffered a little bit from sector rotation. Certainly uh, a lot of the stocks that started the, uh, the the big moves after that 2020 bottom, after the coronavirus crash, uh, are not necessarily the stocks that are, uh, you know, driving it forward now. I mean, some of them are the same, but there has been the sector rotation and even like, you know, November of 2020 after vaccine day yep. on November 9th, there was this big shift into more of the cyclical play. So I guess two questions for you. Number one, um, how how have you been handling some of the sector rotation? Have you been taking profits on some things to move that money elsewhere or just kind of waiting for some of the stuff to come back? And uh, number, number two, um, you know, some of these pullbacks have, have led to severe drawdowns. Yeah. Um, how do you handle that? Do you kind of take some off or uh, do you just kind of, hey, I'm, this, is, this is where my stop is. This is, this is what I'm holding and uh, I can suffer through the drawdown with, the, with enough cushion. Yeah, I don't like to suffer through drawdowns. Um, I, I mean, nobody does, but I'm saying I, I, don't, take, uh, I don't take big drawdowns. Um, and now, but we have to differentiate if if I have a, a nice profit on a stock, then then you're kind of in a little position of comfort to where you say, OK, I got it right. Um, it's you know, it's moved up a bit. Uh, maybe I have some really nice gains in it. And yes, it's healthy for the stock. And this is the stock. This is the market. It's healthy for these little pullbacks. It's healthy for this little ebb and flow. A stock that just runs up every day gets really, really risky the higher it goes. So I look at these little pullbacks and I think, you know, this is a, this is a good thing. And if I have a if I have a big profit on something, then I will absolutely take some off the table. But it's not because I fear that the stock is going to go down it's because that position because it's up so much that has that's a larger allocation right. in an account and so then it's really just a function of 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 taking you know taking some off the table and then yeah maybe you find something something else uh to deploy that cash into or or maybe you're just comfortable holding cash um, but I, I really think that you should kind of chase the, the stock up with sales, but you should never be, unless you're really thinking that, that the end is, is here, you should never really be taking it all off the table. Uh, I know, for example, um, Dave Ryan was bullish on Generac. Um, right. <laughs> you, Arusha, yeah, yeah. you were at yeah. that course, weren't you? Like yeah, you, I was at the course, and and he, actually, David spoke about Generac on the podcast. Yeah, um, around it, it hadn't even broken out yet. It, it was on the verge of breakout. Maybe broke out like uh, maybe a few weeks later, or stuff like that. And and yeah, uh, yeah I mean, he uh, really called uh, called an amazing uh, uh, a run here. Yeah, and I, I forget when I forget. You know, we don't have to get too much into that, but I forget whether he was looking at it for the thirty, the breakout above thirty bucks. It, it was around sixty. It, oh. it was it was a breakout here. Well, I'm highlighting it on the video version, but it, oh. it was right around. Yeah, it was right around the April, uh, April May 2019. That that oh. episode we were talking about there. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this: he was in it before then. <laughs> <laughs> He was just being, I think he was just being uh, uh, humble, but he was using the podcast to pump it up, obviously. Hey, man, what happened? <laughs> what happened? This thing went, uh, you know, went up like SpaceX. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. So it really took off there. Thanks, Dave. I got to get a hold of him and see what his next magical trick is. It's Early. true. Well, I mean, he is on IVD Live every Tuesday. Yeah. And I always yeah, have it on, on the schedule. David's going to be on. Let me let me hear what David's gonna say, and he's always uh, okay. he's always highlighting something new. 
Yeah, I didn't know he was on every Tuesday. Every Tuesday, I mean, yeah. I've seen him several times because I typically watch uh, I typically watch IBD live, but you know, sometimes I get busy. Uh, but Dave Ryan is yeah, yeah, he's he's the man. Uh, he's he's definitely the guy to listen to. Not now, Dan, l- l- let me ask you. Well, so we'll go back to the market just very quickly because I'm going to talk about this a little bit yesterday because yesterday's uh, action was definitely it, it, it wasn't good. Right. I mean, right. The, the way it reversed. And so we were talking about kind of the concept of shots across the bow. Right. right? Where you take one big hit. And, and, and then, you know, the market kind of crawls back up again and you think you're going to be okay. And it's all it's doing, it's setting you up for the next big hit. Talk a little bit about that concept and how you can determine whether it is a shot across the bow or maybe it's just a pullback. Sure. Yeah. Um, one of the, you know, uh, several years ago, probably about, probably about 10 years ago, um, I, you know, I was really, really studying charts and I, you know, I thought I was doing great. Uh, I'm like, I know so much. Mm-hmm. And then I would be into these stocks that they were awesome performers, but then they weren't performing. And I'm going like, what the heck's going on? And I, w- I would look at the market and I would see the same thing where I thought the market was really strong and it turns out it wasn't. I thought a stock was really strong and it turns out it wasn't. And so I would look at these charts and I would study them like, what did I miss? And there are so many times when what I missed was this this break, this break of key support or a moving average, uh, the 50 day moving average. If a stock breaks the 200 day moving average, you know, I don't care, I'm not in that thing anyway. Um, but a break of the 50 day moving average or a nice trend line that has been supporting that stock. It's well established. So I would see like, OK, well, hmm, OK, that stock broke that. But then, it, you know, it was down there like a week, maybe 10 days. And then it's right back up into the channel. It's all good. And so I looked at those. And I started seeing them enough times to say, you know, this was like the this was the bears, this was the market sending a shot across the bow. Um, nobody got hurt because the stock recovered. But what that was really telling us was there's not the institutional sponsorship that there was. Maybe the institutions are even selling, but when institutions start kind of pulling their arms in. And that's going to be the end of the market or a stock, at least for a while, because they're buying lower and they're selling higher. If they weren't doing that, they wouldn't be institutions. They would be broke. Um, So I I really look at that first big move down as a shot across the bow. And one of the stocks that we can look at, I don't know if you want to get into a a particular stock, but I was looking at Zoom. You know, they reported earnings were you know, not really good. I like Zoom. I know you guys do too, because we're using it right now. Yeah. Um, But, you know, that stock was a monster stock. And then in uh, November, a year ago, November, this broke below the 50 day moving average. Um, On vaccine day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty decisively. And then, but then it rallied up back to the 50 day moving average, but it just stayed there a day. And then it pulled back from there. That was that was really the shot across the bow. I mean, yep. we could b- look back earlier and do some results oriented, uh, you know, analysis, but you know that never works. But when you see that kind of pullback in uh, last November, the recovery. The only reason the recovery is a good one, and it was almost thirty percent, is because that's your shorting opportunity. Right. Uh, when you see this stock get so broken and then it rallies up, but it doesn't continue very far. Now, you know that that big move that's got everybody interested, that's over. And then since that time, I mean, it's even more so today. I think yesterday I was looking at it, it's down 60%. Uh, now, at one point it was down you know, 66%. So this is a kind of thing that when it's over, it's over. And, and you can look at PayPal, for example, that's, it didn't have the kind of move that Zoom had had, but you can clearly see what happened there as well. The stock started printing, 
after the July high, the yep. stock started printing lower highs and lower lows, and it never made it past that 50 day moving average. And I know, I mean, somebody was buying that stock that was being sold so much. People were buying a stock that was going lower because they were trying to catch the bottom. They're trying to bottom right. fish. And, and, you know, you'll see that in that shot across the bow. Um, yeah. too. And the people that are bottom fishing are generally not the best fishermen. And, and just to kind of, you know, make a quick comment on Zoom, um, this is one of the reasons why we pay so much attention to the technicals, especially on the selling side. Because if you look at those fundamentals, what's not to like at the point where it's having that problem, uh, you're looking at triple digit earnings growth, you're looking at triple digit revenue growth, um, you know, margin, you know, pre-tax margins are great. Everything looks rosy, but uh, something was obviously wrong in the chart. So uh, we're going to get a little bit more into some of these details uh, and, and really the kind of the cycle of the markets uh, when we come back. So make sure you stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. Do you feel like you're always late to the best trades? You don't have to kick yourself for those missed opportunities any longer. Today is your day. Vantage Point's artificial intelligence has helped traders of all experience levels with its predictive analysis forecasting. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how their AI automatically recognizes global market patterns well ahead of the news to help you pick the best trade. Go to www.freestockcoaching.com to join a free live training session today. Vantage Point's patented artificial intelligence can give you a massive edge. Don't hesitate. Save your seat now. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Vantage Point. It's Justin Nielsen here along with Arusha Paris and our special guest, Dan Fitzpatrick of the Stock Market Mentor, founder of that uh, wonderful website. So, uh, Dan, we were talking a lot about, you know, these cycles and the shot across the bows. Um, let's, let's maybe turn our attention back to the S&P 500 and kind of get back to this whole cycle of the market um, and where we're at there. It is, was this a shot across the bow in your, in your mind? Uh, that we um, saw in September. Yeah, and it, it actually was um, that area. That area right there. It's you know, it was a decisive. You know, just recall recall what I said about Zoom. You don't have to go back to that chart, but it was a decisive break below the 50-day moving average. And then what happened after that? It came back up and just kind of tested the 50, mm -hmm. and then fell back again. And it actually hit a lower low, and and then. But wait, there's more. And then it comes up and uh, hits a lower high. Yeah. And then we get a higher low. So it's kind of like an, an inverse head and shoulder continuation pattern, which right. skeptics out there, it actually is a pattern. Um, and so then it, it breaks back up and we're back in the channel now. We're up at new highs and everything's fine. Uh, but you can't lose sight of that. Now, you know, the shot across the bow, that was the first instance in a long time when the S&P has fallen below that key moving average and hasn't recovered right away. Right. You know, you can, you can look at it over the last year and there are several times when it tested it, but that one that you're looking out there in, in uh, early March, right? you know, that was just like a one day. One yeah, really quick. Yeah. Yeah, if that was a band, it would be aha, um, <laughs> you know, just like bam, right back up. You got to be old to know that. But anyway, um, so we get back up here and we're right back in the channel. But what this is telling me is that, um, you know, maybe maybe institutions, maybe traders are already loaded up on stock. And so then when this when this pulls back, they don't have any more money to put to work. So you can kind of look at it in two different ways and neither one of them is good. Um, you could say traders are fully loaded up. They don't have enough money to buy the dip and that's why the market fell uh, like it did and didn't recover. And then ultimately it did, why? Because a lot of traders sold and no place else to go. So they're back into the market. Okay, the other scenario is, and by the way, if that's the case, you know, they still have less firepower and they're also nervous. 
Um, and then on the other hand, maybe there's institutions that are saying, you know what, it's been a heck of a year. Um, maybe we better lock in some gains here. And so then they're doing that. And because we're getting into the last quarter of the year, and it's been a heck of a year, they're not really interested in buying and say, oh my gosh, you know, I got to make my numbers. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have already made their numbers. Now they're just don't let me lose it. I mean, I'm happy with my results this year. I don't manage money other than my own, but you know, I've had a pretty good year, not as good as others that I know, but um, a hell of a lot better than most people. I don't, I don't want to be aggressive right now. And so, but also then when you look at this shot across the bow, you have to say, all right, where else would that money be going into? You know, it's my belief that money Generally speaking, money doesn't shift between equities and bonds. I think that's kind of a different market altogether. And I know that um, from everything that I know during the trading day, um, traders drink a lot of coffee and they go out for a lot of smoke breaks. Um, bonds traders read the paper. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's just really nothing to do. And so I don't really look at that as where, um, where money would go. I just look at it as kind of a sector rotation. And so maybe that's what we saw uh, mm -hmm. back there. But no matter which way you slice it, I don't really feel like that was a healthy a healthy pullback. I think it stayed there too long. I think so. I think it was a shot across the bow that we just want to pay attention to. Now, now let's go a little bit further into that too, Dan, with kind of the participation or the narrowing participation right. that we're seeing in, in the market. So that 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 narrowing is is adding more towards what, what you're saying. Talk a little bit more about that and, and how that uh, goes into your analysis. Uh, you, you're talking about like the, the breadth indicator. The breadth indicator, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't, I don't look at a lot of um, I don't look at a lot of breadth indicators because to me it does all boil down to stocks. Which mm -hmm. ones am I in? And we could have the best breadth in the world, and if I'm in the wrong stocks, you know, I'm not making money. On the other hand, we could have bad breath like Listerine market. And, um, you know, if, if I'm in the right stocks, then I'm doing just fine. So the only time I really pay attention to market breadth is at what I feel are extremes. And yeah. a couple of few things that I look at, first of all, um, the, well, the VIX isn't a breadth indicator, that's sentiment, but I'll look at the percentage of stocks that are above their 40 day um, moving average um, and the percentage that are above their 200 day moving mm -hmm. average. And, you know, that stuff is really, really, really effective on looking at bottoms. Like I said earlier, it's their events, you know, they're not right. processes. Bottoms are like, what the heck happened? How did I lose all my money? I was fine uh, last month and I've been white knuckling it ever since. Now I have to sell everything and tomorrow's the beginning of the rally. Um, so that's the type of thing where I will look at, say, the percentage of stocks above their 200 day moving average. I'm looking at my charts here. And back in March of last year, you know, there was, there was, uh, at one point, there was 2.6% of all stocks were above their 200 day moving average. Wow. And that was absolutely Remarkably low. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like, you know, they, they didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, they threw the whole account over the cliff and down the waterfall. And I mean, then it's, you know, and I'm, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be honest. I didn't capitalize that on that as much as I should have. I mean, I, you know, I got my members in pretty early and then I showed them how to uh, how to scale in and get more involved over the next few weeks. But, you know, if I had it to do over again and the cool thing about the market is there's always another time to do it over again. It just mm -hmm. won't happen for a while. I would have said, guys, put in everything, take out a second, uh, <laughs> put it all in, tell your kid, you know, to put off college for a year because you're going to make his tuition in the next six months. Uh, you know, these are really, really critical signals. But uh, the, the way that I really look at this stuff in this kind of market is, 
if there's a greater percentage of stocks below these key moving averages, what that's telling you is what is above most stocks? Resistance, supply. A stock that falls below its 200, for example, there's 40 45% of stocks are above. So there's 55, good math, 55% uh, um, is now below their 200 day moving average. Well, and that's you the know, current number, right? That's the current number yeah. right mm -hmm. now. And so you know that if, if, you, if a stock is below its 200 day moving average, that's a lot of supply. A lot of supply pushed the stock down that far. And then as the stock's falling, there are buyers and they're buying on the way down and pretty soon they're unhappy. And that means that as the stock starts running out of sellers and it starts moving up, there's going to be more sellers that keep, keep pushing that stock down. That's why we like to buy stocks that are going up. So if you've got a stock below the, the 200, it's just not going to get that much traction. If you're buying that stock, you're buying it because you want to be right, as opposed to, hey, I think I'm going to make money on this stock. And so when I see this number, and, and that's a pretty low number, it's you know been a lot lower, um, like a lot lower. Uh, that well, yeah, tells you said two percent. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't get much well, lower than that. <laughs> yeah, that that is that's a lot lower. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so and, is is there a level that you're looking at that is like would be low enough to make you think that you're having more of that event type uh, situation versus, um, you yeah. know, noteworthy? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I'll say, you know, recently, um, you know, the low was like 38%. Uh, I'm looking at the, the in, yeah, there's 38% above. But what's really noteworthy to me where it really starts to get my attention is when there's 20%. Okay. Because, um, at that point, you know, it, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty weak, it's a pretty weak market, but here's the thing on that. If this gets down to 20%, I'm actually, I'm not looking at it like, oh my gosh, you know, it's time to sell. Uh, I'm looking at this like, okay, things could be getting pretty interesting here. Right. If we get a big whoosh down, then that's a great buying opportunity. If we don't, you were probably just going to see some meandering because there's so many stocks that are in trouble. And if you look at the uh, percentage of stocks that are above their 40 day, and this is where we're just right on the money, 50%, then that's the same kind of signal to me, only it's a shorter term. It's a shorter term trade. You know, we all buy stocks above the 50. Well, now we, we have our, our candidates, if that's all you're looking at, our list of candidates just got cut in half. Yeah. And, and so that in my mind, it, you know, we were 70 just to, just a, a, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were up at 70. And so now we got this big sell off. And I think that's what people are, what people are kind of griping about. They're uneasy about it because, Hey, why, why aren't my trades working? Um, and you can see that in this breadth indicator, but at 50%, you know, I don't, I don't really think you can read anything into that that's going to impact your trading. I think it helps to know it, but when it really comes down to it for all of us, it's not really what you think that matters, it's what you do that matters. And that's why I really feel like it's important for all of us to have a particular trading process that you can just execute with extreme prejudice. It's like if a stock or the market doesn't meet your criteria, don't change your criteria, at least not right away. You know, just say, wait a minute, what's going on? My trades aren't working. And that's, by the way, this is where, this is where I think people make big mistakes. Um, e even funds, you know, there's such a thing as style drift to right. where Yep. You know, they're, oh, we, we specialize in this. And then after a while, the fund manager's going like, crap, you know, this value thing isn't working. Maybe let's buy Tesla, um, you know, and suddenly it's not a value fund anymore. But the point is, I think a lot of traders, a lot of retail traders, they're always trying to be in the right stocks and they're always chasing 
and because they're because the stocks that are really get my attention are the ones that I look at and go crap. You know, I wish that stock had got my attention about two months ago. Um, you know, so you wind up seeing these stocks that that have made big moves. And so everybody gets in that, you know, it's a chase fest. We're all chasing the same stock. But then at some point that game runs out. It's done. You know, musical chairs, music stops. But then they still try the same strategy. This is why we see like on some of these on some of these IPOs, the real big ones, I think maybe Riven might, I haven't looked at that today, but yeah, I mean, this might be an example where, you know, Rivian made everybody a genius, but then as it fell down, you know, there's still buyers that come in, right. push yeah. the stock up a little bit, and then they get whacked. Yep. And so what this is, is it's the same traders trying the same strategy on a stock that's clearly different. And I think that what that's a tendency that many traders have. And, and it's just simply because they don't know any better. You know, nobody's stupid. They, you know, just like they don't know any better. And what I think people don't understand is you don't have an edge because of your process. You have an edge because of your discipline. If you are disciplined, then your process is what keeps you out of trouble and it gets you into good stocks. And so if you're disciplined, you see, well, my discipline isn't working. I haven't been making the money that I typically do on winning trades. I've been stopped out a lot on my losing trades. So let me back up here a little bit and see what I need to do. What's happening here? Because all I care about is, am I making money? I don't really care about my process. I know it works. But if it's not working, then that means I'm not making money. So what do I care about? I just don't want to lose money. A lot of traders don't do that. They just keep, you know, when they're, they're momentum traders, that's awesome. They make a bunch of money. When the market corrects, they're still momentum traders and they lose a bunch of money. And a lot of times they, they lose more than they made. And, it, you know, it took me three different times when I first started out. Um, to learn that lesson. That's just what we do. Yep. We make those stupid mistakes and they're only stupid after we figure out exactly what we did. And then they were, they're not even stupid. They're just like, crap, I didn't know any better. Now I do. Let, let, don't let me do that again. What should happen with the typical trader, you know, in my view is there are certain strategies that work. You should stick to those strategies instead of bouncing around from one thing to the next to the next, because you're, you're not going to have an edge in every single type of market, in every single strategy. And it's, you know, we talk about it. I've heard, you know, you guys talk about it. Everybody does about getting chopped up. You yeah. know, the market's really choppy, man, I'm getting chopped up on that stock or something. And, you know, that's an indication of a stock or a market that's not working the way you thought that it would or it should. And in my view, the best way, this might surprise you, but the, the best way to handle that stuff, if you can, you know, if you can handle it, zoom out to a weekly chart. Yeah. Just stop, stop yeah. looking at this. Stop looking at that and say, let me look and see what the what the stock is really doing. You know, I've mentioned this a, a few times, but like go to Tesla and look at the weekly chart. There's like not there's really on the weekly chart. This is actually looks like health, healthy consolidation. Uh, you know, it's a nice breakout there from 900 and it looks like really healthy consolidation there. There's nothing wrong with that stock. There's everything right with it, actually. And then, but then if you look at the daily chart, I could just see people getting in and out and in and out, buying high, selling low, waiting for right. the next breakout. Um, so anyway, so I just think that you have to understand that sometimes the market's going to reward big risk taking. Most of the time, it's just going to reward selective buying and sticking with a few stocks that are working. Well, and I think, you know, to your point, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a matter of not knowing any better, but sometimes, uh, and this is what frustrates me the most is sometimes I kind of look back on it. And I'm like, I did know better. I let my emotions, you know, get away from me or that lack of discipline for whatever reason 
Um, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. You fall victim to, to some of those old uh, things that have thwarted you in the past. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because one of the things that I've, uh, one of the things that I've, I've noticed in my own trading and, you know, I've spent probably all told definitely over a hundred thousand dollars in, in going to workshops and, you know, there's a lot of travel involved and some of them are pretty expensive. Some of them I've been to a few different times, but what I've noticed about virtually all of them is you can learn how to trade. You can learn all these things. My gosh, you know, there's just like how to make money in stocks, you know, right. Bill O'Neill, you know, he's, he's the king. Read that 15 times, memorize it, you know how to trade. But what people don't really do is they don't have a way to actually implement that yeah. stuff because we're our own, you know, I've been trying to lose weight, you know, for a year, more than a year. And I'm sure that I would be able to lose that weight if I didn't like ice cream. You know, <laughs> right. So, but that damn ice cream's in the freezer for a while up until the time that it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an indication where I know what I need to do. Yeah. I just don't have the discipline to do it. And so, with trading, what I've found is that when people truly know why they're trading, you know, I have, I'm actually developing. Um, with, you know, with uh, a friend of mine, Dan Sullivan, who doesn't even trade, he has this, uh, this exercise uh, called the impact filter where, and it's definitely I'm modifying it for trading, but the idea is this, like, okay, what's the task? What do you want to do? Okay. What are the benefits from that? Okay. Is that what you want? Now, if you don't do it, what's the consequence of that? Okay. Right. Now, if you know the benefits, you, you know what the bad consequences are. Now the real guts of the analysis comes in. How do I actually get those benefits? What do I do and what do I not do? What is the cost? You know, what, yeah, what do you have to pay? You, have you know, that. and it's not just necessarily money. <laughs> well, yeah, like Justin, you know, let's say you're, you know, you've got your retirement accounts that you're trading. Um, so you're, you know, you're trading those retirement accounts. And what's your goal? To lose your dough? No, you know, you don't want to do that. Uh, you want to, you know, you want to grow your retirement account. Well, why? Because you don't want to work. You want to support your family. Maybe you want to go around the, whatever the thing is, but you have things that you want to do with that retirement account. Write that stuff down. And then what has to happen for you not to be able to do that? Well, you got to lose money. So, okay, how do I make sure that I don't lose money? What's my process for that? So you have all this written out, like what is the impact of what I'm doing in my trading account? If you start looking at that every day or even every week, you're going to trade differently. And the difference is you're going to start doing the things that you know you're supposed to do. Yeah. You're not going to have as many like, ah, why did I do that? I know not to do that. You know, that's my next thing that I'm, I'm teaching is, you know, you can teach people how to trade. It doesn't really take that long. It's the, you psychology, can 98 different <laughs> nuances and they're, they're all good, but you can know everything. But if you're still chasing a stock that's up 15% in a day, that's not going to work too well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you got to give people the, the methodology for doing what they know they should be doing. Yeah. And that's where people fall flat is on the psychology. Yep. Um, so, okay, Dan, where, where can people find more information on this? Uh, certainly your, your website. So if you could give that to us real quick. Yeah, you can go to stockmarketmentor.com. Perfect. And if you do this, if you do this now, you're probably just going to see a messy website okay. um, because we're really starting this. Is I haven't taught one in over five years, um, so I'm really looking forward to this one. But if you go to stockmarketmentor.com, definitely sign up for the free chart of the day where we're sending people out. But on on uh, Thursday, uh, typical cyber, whatever it is, cyber Black deals. Friday, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, think about it Thursday. Black Friday. Um, we're we're going to market it then. Sorry, it's taking me so long. We're going to market it. Mar then. Market what? Pretty, pretty you gotta tell us what it is. What, what are you marketing? Okay. It's a three day. It's a three okay. day workshop. It's Saturday, Sunday and Monday. And I'm walking people through 
like at least two, maybe even three different trading processes because one size doesn't fit all. And then I'm taking it a step further and giving people some psychological and some real process driven exercises to get there. And it's a specific way that I'm teaching uh, where I take you through the four stages of competency. If anybody wants to know about that, you can just Google it. It's a well-known yep. way yep. to learn. Exactly. And that's going to be in March. So uh, definitely something to check March. out. Yeah, First it's, weekend it's of March. Two, two hardcore days of learning and then a third day, we're just trading all day. Live trading, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we come back, uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the stocks that are on Dan's radar and do some analysis. So make sure you stay tuned for that. We'll be yeah. right back. Do you want to conquer market volatility? We can help you protect your hard-earned capital. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how Vantage Point's AI technology can forecast stock market trends up to 72 hours in advance with incredible accuracy. Vantage Point's patented technology analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds, so you can finally stop guessing what's going to happen next. Check out www.freestockcoaching.com and experience Vantage Point for free. Learn how successful traders generate their wealth. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Okay, welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Pires and our special guest, Dan Fitzpatrick from Stock Market Mentor. So let's take a look real quick at some of the stocks that are on your radar, Dan. Um, where, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with, uh, and this is something that scares a lot of people, the Chinese stocks, mm -hmm. uh, XPeng, XPEV. Yeah, Xpeng is, I, I bought that today. I had never owned it before, um, mm -hmm. but I, I kind of bought a slug of it today because of the way it, it broke out. And if we want to kind of break that pattern down, um, you can see back in um, on that 47.98. I have Market Smith too, by the way. I highly <laughs> recommend it, okay? Little plug for you guys. Um, yeah, and early July when it hit uh, 47.98 on big volume, you know, that was a, a pretty good move and it kind of established the ceiling. And then when this came up, I, I just didn't see it uh, at the time. When this popped up again on October 25th, that was that initial breakout point on massive volume. That really told you that something was going on with the stock. And so it pulls back. But it, it didn't really reverse. It just kind of hugged that mm -hmm. uh, that breakout level at 48. You know, I think at one point it pulled back maybe 6%, mm -hmm. uh, but, but not that much, you know, really when you look at it. And so when, when I saw it today, and I, I had a couple of members asking about it yesterday, um, and uh, so I looked at it again today. We actually, I just actually opened up an active trade on it, which is what we do with uh, on Stock Market Mentor. But I liked the volume. They reported great earnings mm -hmm. for a Chinese electric vehicle company that doesn't make any money. Um, you know, it was pretty good. But the thing that really got me is what you're looking at right there, Arusha, that chart. Mm -hmm. That is a really good looking chart for what I would say is the beginning of a markup phase where the stock is just coming out of that base. And I, I think with this volume, there's really not a lot of supply overhead other than uh, by people who get you know tired of making money. And that thing that you see clear back in January, um, in my mind, when a, when a top is that far back, I don't really think it makes that much difference because think about all the trading that's gone in yeah. since that since that top. You know, anybody anybody who bought there is either fully committed and they might be or they're, you know, holding the stock all that time and they should be committed. Um, but, uh, you know, there's so there's just been a lot of profit taking, a lot of loss taking. And now with this base that really started in July, um, you know, I think it just broke through the ultimate supply, that $48 um, price tag, and then today 50. So I really like the way this stock is trading. And you'll notice the relative strength um, is 88. Um, just prior to today, it was down at 81, which wasn't that great. But I like relative strengths in this area because in the high 80s. 
because they really come on everybody's radar when they get above 90. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I'm if if the pattern is there, which this is, then I feel like I'm kind of getting a little early jump on it before it hits a lot of people's screens who they'll screen for stocks just above uh, with a with an RS rating just above um, 90. And so, um, you know, I, I like this stock a lot. Um, Does it surprise you that this was acting so strong when the market, uh, you know, at, at least had a, a couple uh, rough days here, especially since this is more on the risk on side, uh, where it seemed like a lot of money was coming out of those areas the last couple of days? Yeah, it, you know what, that it really didn't, it really didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. uh, it it kind of, I guess you could say it, it surprised me. Um, but, you know, I'm not looking for every stock to trade in, in uh, sync with this type of thing. Right. But when you think about it, you know, what did, what did this stock really do? It's not like it's super overbought. You know, a lot of these other stocks, they pulled back. Um, you can look at the, you know, bubble vision, uh, you know, Supreme, which is the ARK Innovation Fund, uh, ARKK. <laughs> That's to me, that's the epitome of, um, you know, insanity starting to not be rewarded. But if you look at uh, Xpeng, it's almost just the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I see something like this, when I see a stock that is in a sector that's generally not working, when I see that stock working, that's the one where you really want to go to, because if that sector or that group is not working, and your stock is, then when that sector starts to work again, yep. your stock's going to be right in the front row, right on point. The position. Uh, and so, yeah, I, for that reason, it didn't really bother me. Um, and uh, let's see, I wanted to look at. No, well, and to your point, I, that relative strength line, I think really speaks volumes there. The fact that, you know, that's relative to the S&P 500, um, that getting to new highs, I mean, that says something. Yeah, but and see, this is here's another thing too. If you look at the number of funds that have owned that uh, that stock, it went from uh, 450 uh, of December of last year. Now it's up to 622 mm -hmm. as of September, and by this rate, you know that's going to go up uh, for mm -hmm. this fourth quarter. And so when you see that kind of increased sponsorship among funds. You know, they these guys, for the most part, you know, they don't buy a stock to trade it. You know, oh, I bought it at 40. It's at 50. I'll sell. Uh, they're typically buying this stuff and they're taking uh, stock out of the float. And, and that ultimately makes it harder to buy. There's, you know, for the volume, uh, there's there. That isn't an issue now. The stock's easy to buy with such a big almost, uh, you know, 638 million shares in the float. Um, but I think over time, the stock's going to get tougher to buy. So, you know, I like it. Those are kind of unorthodox reasons other than, Ooh, look at earnings. They're increasing every quarter. Uh, but to me, you know, you look at the chart and it's like, that's where you start. Then you can look at all these things that I'm just talking about. And then when you're done talking about that, then you go back to the chart and say, Hmm, what's the chart saying? And the chart saying, buy. So anyway, that's how I look at that. Well, kind of uh, some of the stocks that have been also showing a little bit of rotation here. Uh, the last couple of days, while you know your, your, your software stocks have been coming in, um, energy stocks, oil stocks have been coming on really strong. So are there any uh, stocks in there that you've been looking at? Um, yeah, one of, the, one of my faves is um, Denberry, D-E-N. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that, I mean, look at, are, are you guys seeing any similarities in these charts? You know, mm -hmm. back starting in July, when the stock started to pull back, you know, it ultimately pulled back to uh, looks like 66, something like that, uh, maybe a little lower. Um, but it just formed, you know, a, a really, really good cup pattern. And, and I know Dave Ryan would say, well, it's not really... <laughs> It's not really a cup, it's something else. Um, but that's really a good cup. And then when it broke out here, um, that to me was a really, really solid breakout in late October. And now this pullback, in my view, is just kind of forming a handle. It's a bit steep, 
but it's this is also not doing a, a ping pong thing or a Super Bowl where it's just bouncing right off the 50 and rocketing higher. I think this could probably do a little more work right around here. It would be really healthy if it's stayed around 80, 82 for a while. But I think ultimately this stock um, is is going higher. You know, it's, it's in one of the strong sectors, uh, relative strength that doesn't get too much better than 98. Um, and the, you know, the, the fundies are great. Their margins after taxes are, are accelerating. Um, you know, revenues still pretty good. Um, earnings, you know, up 85% versus the same quarter the prior year. Uh, three to five year growth rate is over 100%. Um, you know, there's, and they're in oil and gas exploration and production. And I know it's all in vogue to be, we're all electric out and, you know, and all that stuff. We're going to get rid of oil and gas. Uh, the market knows that that's not going to happen. It'll be talked about, but, you know, then everybody's going to get in their gas guzzling cars and go out to dinner. <laughs> you know, they are, you know, or they're going to drive their Prius and feel really good about it, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, the oil and gas is still going, and I think the market gets that. And so I think this is going to continue to move. I think it's going to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Well, and it certainly had uh, quite the move where it was just uh, holding that 10-week moving average line yeah. just so well, you know, trending so well. Um, mm -hmm. And really, when you look at this as just being, uh, you know, kind of the first base after that, that move, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty compelling. Well, see, you know, it's interesting, though, uh, you go back to what we were talking about a while ago with the shot across the bow. Um, you could look at this and say, well, you know, what started the first base that actually was in July um, and into August, that was a big shot across the bow. Uh, but it actually really wasn't because, yeah, the stock came up and hit the 50. But then when it pulled back, it just pulled back into the same range. Right. There's nothing wrong with it. And then when it starts climbing up again uh, and holding in September, that's when you say, well, okay, well, I have a different take on this stock now. This is not a stock in trouble. This is a really healthy uh, move sideways. And, and like you said, Justin, it's just the first really good base. Um, so, yeah, so I, I like it. This was a buy, buy, buy stock. Um, now, one thing that uh, I actually bought this early, kind of as it was coming up off of the uh, uh, back above the 10 week moving average line, um, but I got shaken out. And one of the reasons was, uh, you know, something that bothered me that it seemed like this turned into the laggard of the group. Um, right. There were, you know, now it looks like, you know, great support right where you'd like to see it. So, you know, in a vacuum, this, this looks great to me, but um, do you ever look at the other members of the group and uh, kind of get a little FOMO of, oh, is this, is this truly the leader? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. I mean, I, I, I did the same thing, Justin, it, yeah. where I tried this one and, and I got shaken out of it and I cut it because other ones were working better. But then well, and David Ryan was kind of, I think this is one, the this one like Cleveland Cliffs, you know, he started calling the little porcupine because it yeah. just, you know, kept on having this little, uh, these little needles sticking up, these little quills sticking right. up uh, that just couldn't make any traction. But Cleveland uh, Cliffs? Cleveland Cliffs? Yeah, yeah no, Cleveland no, no. Cliffs he, he was, was yeah, well, but well, that he was, was another he one was that he was calling, calling uh, 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 porcu a, a porcupine. Uh, well, well, that's what like. he was calling. He's yeah. got all these big spikes, all yeah. these big spikes up. Yep. Okay, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. And uh, uh, you got another stock that you want us to take a look at? Yeah, you can take it. Uh, look at, at Nucor. Okay. And this is a a NUE. NUE, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, this is another one where we have, uh, we have an active trade going. Um, it hasn't exactly been shooting the lights out here. Um, the pattern is a little bit deep there from 128.81 down, down to 93.33. Um, um, you know, looks, looks better on my chart than it does you, yours, but I know it's a, that's a deep pattern. So I think this is going to take a while. I think this is going to take a while to, to form more of a base and, and, you know, hopefully ultimately move higher, but the steel stocks have in general, you know, I think they have more upside, but they have been kind of flopping around um, for a while. Uh, you don't have to go bang through a bunch of charts, but they all 
they all kind of look like they're forming these high, vol more volatile bases. But if you look at what's coming down the road with with all the spending, yeah, um, you know, I think the basic materials, including uh, you know metals, I think they're going to kind of reassert themselves. You know, that's my that's my suspicion. But here's the thing too that's really important. What what I think only matters if the stocks um, if the stocks back that up yep. because you know I'm not Nostradamus. Well, I could be actually. It's a little known fact that this guy made more flipping predictions, um, you know, than Hershey's makes chocolate chips. Uh, and so you know, but he but he got enough of them right to where it's like, oh, he's the big fortune. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but anyway, um, so I don't look at like my opinions that I just shared in all of this. They have to be borne out by the by the stocks. There's a, the only time I've ever said the market was wrong was just before I lost my butt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then it turns out the market might have been wrong, but it had it was powerful enough to be able to actually define right. And so I didn't figure that out then. So uh, thanks again, Dan, for coming on the show, and good luck with your presentation that you're coming up with uh, for that first weekend of March that yep. people can find at Stock Market Mentor. And yep. uh, Thursday. 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 Thursday is when that's going to drop. Okay. And on the show next week, we are going to have John Najarian coming back to the show. He is the founder of Market Rebellion, and I'm sure he'll be coming over and talking about what's going on in the market and some of the unusual option activity like he normally does. Uh, that is going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for watching or listening, if that's what you've been doing. And from all of us here, we hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. Take care. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you wanna watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.